Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields. Very biased collection. So here is one, well, it's called Lee Theory, not Lie Theory. There was a person with his name, uh, Lee, Sophus Lee, uh, a, a mathematician. So it's not Lie, it's Lee. Lee Theory. Um, and yeah, so Lee Theory, if you, you might have seen a lecture on it. So there's sometimes you see a lecture on Lee Theory, but it's usually very different from the origin of Lee Theory, which I'm trying to explain in um, this video. Uh, hoping to motivate why you would care instead of going into some details um, and there's some reason why the modern lecture is different from the origin so usually how lectures evolve over time um, just very different from the original source and yeah and we'll see actually one reason why it kind of changed a lot it's kind of the main theory of main theorem of Lie theory so uh, let's see what is Lie theory Again, I said again, so I would like to motivate it along the history of the subject, um, which again might look very different if you haven't seen it, or if you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, there's nothing to compare it to anyway, so who cares? So let's go. Um, the discrete groups. So, Galois theory. So let's say you have an equation and you have those three roots here um, square root of 2, and j is just a third root of unity. So that's some equation of the form x cubed minus 2 equals 0, something like this. And yeah, so you have those solutions and there's a group acting on the solution. And it permutes the solutions. In this case, it's a symmetric group S3. So you have six elements. And yeah, so literally these things illustrate what those elements are doing. And some of them just permute those. Well, permutation group. And the whole idea of Galois theory is, well... You want to study the polynomial equation, something of this type, yeah? But that turns out to be difficult. So people are trying to solve polynomial equations for centuries, um, and they were not really getting anywhere. Although there's this funny stories about the mostly Italian mathematicians in 1300, 1400, 1500, which were giving one another kind of problems here, solve that equation, solve this equation, because they were kind of uh, finding a general formula is really difficult, unless you're in degree two. So in degree two, the general formula was known for a long time. And so people are wondering, um, how can we solve polynomial equations? Sometimes you can just find roots. Sometimes it seems to be really difficult. Is there some underlying theory yeah, which explains why sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's hard, and maybe even how to get there uh, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy, and maybe even how to get there if it's easy. And yeah, so in the 1800s, -ish, uh, 1800, so 1820-ish, Galois came up with this idea, which was really extremely new, to st study um, the polynomial equations looking at the symmetries of the roots, right? So this is like the symmetries of the roots. The picture of here, like how you can shuffle the roots. Yeah, and what Galois came up with uh, is what is called Galois theory. And the peering groups in Galois theory are subgroups of the somatic group usually, so they're like finite groups, uh, discrete groups. And kind of the idea underlying Galois theory is that kind of the difficulty of the group that you see as a symmetry group of the equation tells you how difficult it is to solve the equation itself. It's kind of the whole idea. Symmetric groups like difficult, uh, easier groups, whatever, circular groups are something you could solve the equation. And that explains why some equations are so much more easy or than, than others. And some of them are easy to solve, some of them are not. So this was like the 1920s-ish, and it caught up. So like in the in, uh, 1920, the 1820s-ish. So around 1850, uh, long after Galois was already dead, people started studying symmetries like the Klein program, the Klein Erlangen program, people started studying symmetries of uh, just in general by just saying okay groups kind of mimic symmetries and this was again mostly related to the finite groups the discrete groups some discrete type of symmetry um symmetries in polynomial equations were the motivating things and people started really liking galois theory at that point and a little bit later maybe in the 1870s ish uh the norwegian mathematician with the name not Lie, but Lee, as I said. So uh, this guy here. 
this guy just just pointing to yeah i should have put up a picture but anyway the the mathematician named lee came up with the following idea yeah maybe maybe what we can do the continuous groups maybe what we can do instead is study the symmetries of a, a polynomial equation study the symmetries of a differential equation because again we want to solve a differential equation but that's uh, also known to be very difficult. So maybe again, studying those groups that appear as the symmetries would kind of help us to understand what when an equation is easy and when an equation is difficult. And the pairing groups turned out to be the continuous groups. Like you should think about matrix groups. And they were given a name later, they were called Lie groups. Well, continuous groups, Lie groups. And again, the kind of the story is really in parallel Kind of the difficulty of the group corresponds to how difficult it is to find equations. For example, the standard differential equation where you get the exponential function has a really easy associated group, while something more complicated, like the Airy equation, which is kind of the next complicated step, has a fairly difficult group associated to it, SO2, which then somewhat explains why the solution, yeah, so it's usually called the solution to that equation is usually called the airy function ai is not nicely expressible in terms of elementary functions yeah, so what really happens here is whenever the group in the discrete case is difficult then you can't express the roots in terms of elementary operations which are like nesting roots or something right so you can't write something easy like square root of third, third root of two if the group is difficult and what roughly happens here, up to some really nasty technicalities, is that if the group of the differential equation is difficult, then the solution to that equation is not expressible anymore in terms of the elementary functions. Yeah? So the, the one corresponding to the exp exponential function is an easy group, the one corresponding to the Airy equation is a difficult group, and indeed the Airy function itself is not nice, it's not expressible in terms of elementary functions. So that was the idea of Lee, kind of really mimic Lee theory, but for, uh, yeah, that was the idea of D, mimic Lee theory, mimic uh, Galois theory, but for the kind of the differential equations. And it sounds very difficult. And the whole point why Lee theory is flying so high, it's kind of really popular topic and an important topic in uh, modern mathematics and beyond, is that this approach, the groups that appear, are actually quite easy. And that's surprising, because they, they look much more difficult than uh, the finite groups, but they somehow have a built-in symmetry, uh, sorry, built-in structure, which makes it easier to study them. And the thing, uh, well, the Lee mostly figured out is this way to go from the continuous to something linear. So the continuous groups, which I will call now the Lie groups, they're actually easier than the discrete groups, which is kind of the finite groups, which is kind of surprising. And what Lee observed essentially is in kind of modern language, that they are smooth manifolds. So there's some smooth structure, some analysis going on, which allows you to define a tangent plane at a point. A tangent plane at a point. And the, the tangent plane at a point has some additional structure because now we have a manifold and a group at the same time, which kind of gives the tangent space an additional structure. And these additional structures are called Lie algebras. And the usual notation is you have a, a capital G for the, for the Lie group and a small German type G, which I really, really can't draw, uh, the German type G for the Lie algebra. And the point is Lie algebra is a tangent space. It's a linear object. It's, a, it's an object of linear algebra. And you might hope and it seems to be completely ridiculous to actually hope that, to study the smooth object using the tangent. And why does it sound ridiculous? Well, if you have some, some curve and you just look at the tangent at a point, uh, whatever, something like that, then it usually doesn't tell you what the curve is, right? The tangent is a local thing, you yeah? so, know? But what happens for Lie groups is kind of a miracle that knowing the tangent at a point essentially recovers the whole group. And why? Well, essentially, well, it's not just a smooth manifold, it's a group. So you can kind of transport using the group rule, the, the group multiplication, the linear structure along your manifold, and then it kind of determines the whole manifold at once. That's what uh, Lee figured out. And kind of the theorem I want to sell here 
is this the Lie group is the smooth object is determined by the Lie algebra, the linear object, which is usually called the Lie group Lie algebra correspondence. And you need to be a little bit careful, and I will comment in a second why. Uh, let's just say we work over R. And then you can do the following. Every Lie group has an associated Lie algebra. Okay. Lie algebra, remember, object of linear algebra. Linear algebra, excellent. Everyone likes linear algebra. Linear algebra is top. I, should, I shouldn't say anyone, everyone likes linear algebra. Everyone should like linear algebra because linear algebra is probably one of the most successful fields of all of mathematics. It's just ridiculously good. Anyway, so you can associate a linear object to a nonlinear object. Um, the other, yeah, f f to a nonlinear object. And in general, you have something like if your nonlinear objects are the same, this is the second point here, then the linear objects are the same. And under some mild assumptions, which I will not comment on, um, the converse is true as well, right? So this is really saying they're essentially the same. All the information of the Lie group is encoded in the Lie algebra, and you can recover them from a linear object. This is kind of really, really strong, right? Kind of nonlinear object, and everything about it encoded is encoded in non is encoded in a linear object. Everything encoded about my red graph, everything about the red graph is encoded in the blue line, which is very strange, right? To this, for this graph, this is certainly wrong, but for a Lie group, it's true. It's kind of very strange. And it essentially explains why the theory is so powerful because you get this ridiculously powerful uh, result. And the way it works is. That the, the maps between them, how you're going to go from the Lie algebra to the Lie group, that the ascent exponential and the logarithm. So there's an explicit way taking either logarithms or exponentials as a part of the reverse function, um, depending whether you want to go from one to the other, uh, to go between the two. And this this is really, really powerful, exponential and logarithm. And this is where this guy a little comes in, because if you remember what the exponential function is, and you just express it as a polynomial, you get this 1 over n factorial x to the times x to the n, right? x of x running over all n. And yeah, 1 over n factorial is a little bit of a shit number in characteristic p. So this whole correspondence essentially breaks down if you're not over something nice like the real numbers. But over the real numbers or the complex numbers or something of characteristic zero, this is actually a ridiculously strong, a ridiculously strong theorem, which kind of explains why, well, you can now study differential equations using a linear algebra approach in some sense, right? And this is really, really good. And it gets even better. So this was essentially what Lee did, but people discovered later, mostly some people like Catan discovered later that it's not it's, it's, it's linear algebra yeah that's fine but it's not just linear algebra it's actually just combinatorics so there is something associated to those Lie algebras which is called a root system or a weight system which essentially is just a very rigid structure so here are the weights for sl4 you can literally see it's kind of built out of in this little picture down here it's, it's built out of tetrahedrons there's a lot of tetrahedrons glued together very rigid structure and they are sent to this structure, and it's a very rigid kind of geometric structure, determines the Lie algebra, and it's essentially just combinatoric, so you can just push all the questions about the non-linear thing, the smooth group, to some form of combinatorics. And yeah, combinatorics is reasonably easy then to solve, and then you could say a lot about them. And this is like the, the whole success of um, kind of Lie theory on in this one slide and kind of you can see now the change let me just comment on that uh what happened in the lecture so in the lecture you mostly then see the combinatorial study you see root systems or lie algebras um and maybe you see the correspondence but rarely the original motivation because it's a little bit nasty to compute those galois type groups for differential equations they're they're called differential galois groups in case you want to google it Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.